Ephesians chapter number 3. Begin reading down in verse number 13. The Bible says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that, ye would, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, we got a lot to tackle there, and I don't know that we're going to get through all of it, so y'all hang in there. We'll move as quick as we can. But here, the Apostle Paul, first 12 verses of this chapter, he goes through, essentially, the call that God has put on his life. The Apostle Paul outlines how he... In fact, he calls himself least of all the saints. He says that he can't believe that God would take him, the least of all saints, and entrust him to become the apostle to the Gentiles. And he notes a few times that, verse number 6 says, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. In other words, God gave it to me so that by his grace and through his power, that gospel would just keep spreading, keep working, and the Gentiles. Then, we get down to verse number 9, Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Well, what's that fellowship? That God, Emmanuel, which was prophesied over in Isaiah, would come and dwell among men, so that men could be reconciled towards God. That was a mystery in the Old Testament. They didn't understand grace, they understood law. And now, the Apostle Paul said, it's not going to lie, you know, for me, the least of all saints, as he called himself, he said, God gave, entrusted me that. He says, I'm burdened, entrusted with, he says, my purpose, the thing that keeps me going in the morning, is that he entrusted it to me to go give it to as many people as I could. And then, he goes on to outline a little bit, in chapter number one and chapter number two, about some of the tribulations that he's going through. In fact, he refers to himself as the prisoner of God. Not a prisoner of man. He says, I'm the prisoner of God. I gave everything over to God when he saved me. And now, whether he wants me in prison, whether he wants me unbound and free preaching the gospel, he said, I'm his. He can do whatever he wants to. He said, but, beginning of chapter number 3, he says there's a purpose for it. He says, currently I'm bound in change, but God has a reason for it. In fact, you go study the book of Acts. You know, the Apostle Paul, while he was still bound, did a great work for the ministry. In fact, when he was writing some of them letters from Rome while he was still a prisoner, he told the churches that all the saints in Rome salute him, even some of Caesar's household. If Paul wouldn't have testified before Caesar, Caesar's family wouldn't have been saved. And why did he testify before Caesar? Because as a Roman citizen, he didn't want to, you know, he knew the Jews couldn't kill him unless the Romans said so. So he appealed to Caesar, as was his right as a citizen. And throughout all that journey, he didn't consider himself a prisoner of man. No, he was a prisoner of God. Every time I read that, I think of that song, I'm a prisoner of love, a slave to the master. Right? I'm not a prisoner out of fear, out of cruelty, out of hate. No, I'm a prisoner of my own choosing because of his love. Then in verse number 13, he says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not in my tribulations. He says, Yeah, I'm going through hard times. He says, But don't use that as an excuse for you to quit. You know why Paul was a prisoner of God? Because he chose to be. What he's saying here is, the hard times can end whenever you want. All you got to do is stop living for God. He said, you're going to be miserable. Right? You're going to fall on your conviction. Holy Ghost is going to try and draw you back to the things of God. 
But he said, if I wanted it to quit, I could have quit a long time ago. He said, I could have just said, kill me. It would have been over. Tribulations would have ended. Long before they ever got so angry they wanted to kill him, they charged him to never speak in the name of Jesus again. Could have ended there. But notice what he said. He says, my tribulations for you. He said, I go through these things so that God can fulfill what He intends for you. Paul would have given up during the tribulations. This book of the Bible wouldn't have been written. Not to mention 12 other ones, maybe 13 if he wrote Hebrews. You say, he endured these tribulations. Why? Because he knew that God still had some to tell. We can go back. We already read it. God revealed the great mystery to him. Right, he was on that road to Damascus. He met God on the way. Right and then, there was another time, we go if we had time, go study where the Apostle Paul said, there was one time, whether it was in the Spirit or whether it was in the body, he didn't know. But he's called up into the third heaven, and God did a little bit of preaching to him. And he said some things that he heard, his fear of God was so strong on him about the whole thing that he didn't even mention it for years. Can you imagine some of the things that he wrote later on that he heard during that experience? I don't know. But I do know that he didn't reveal them until God wanted him to reveal them. If he'd have given up during the tribulations, there'd have been a different person wrote the books of the Bible to us for the whole counsel of God. He's saying, everything I do is for God and it's for the saints. It's for their benefit. He says, so don't look at me and see a reason that you shouldn't live for God. He says, quite contrary. All of my tribulations are because I love God and I love you. And then look at the end of verse number 13. He says, which is your glory. Because of the tribulations of the Apostle Paul, I know what it takes as a newborn, right, washed in the blood, saved individual, what it takes to live a life pleasing unto God. Was it because the Apostle Paul is the only one that did it? No, but God, that's the one that God used to pin it down. If we wouldn't have had them books in the Bible, my glory wouldn't be able to be as good. Why? Because I wouldn't know what God expected of me as a Christian. He says, I go through all of this so that you all can understand what it is that God expects of you. He said, I went through the tribulations before I got to Ephesus and endured them because I knew that God wanted me to go somewhere else. And then from Ephesus and from you know, Corinth, from Galatia, Thessalonica, all these other churches, one day it eventually made its way over to Florence, Kentucky. He said, my tribulations were for your glory, not for mine. He said, I endured because I love God and because God loved you he sent somebody by your way that had been through some tribulations through some hardness and they endured them not for their sake but for your sake he says if you look at me don't look at the bad look at the love then verse number 14 he says for this cause what cause that they faint not for the cause of the gospel of Christ which he was entrusted as a minister. He said, For those causes, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then if we get down to verse number 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. He says, I pray continually. Granted, this was the apostle that wrote, to pray without ceasing. So when the Apostle Paul, every time that I read that he bows his knees or that he's praying, in my mind, whenever it comes across his heart, when God lays it on his heart, he's praying immediately. Every epistle, you'll find that he prays for the churches. He prays for, we can get over to Timothy and Titus, that he's praying for them. You believe that the Apostle Paul was a praying man. So when he says, I bow my I believe that every time the Apostle Paul prayed, whether he was standing, whether he was laying, whether he was chained up in a prison cell, 
wherever he was praying, I do believe that he prayed this as part of his prayers. Not in vain repetition, but because he truly meant it. What's he praying? Lord, strengthen the saints. But notice how he wants them to be strengthened. He doesn't say strengthen them with their own might. No, the arm of flesh will fail you. He doesn't say strengthen them with, you know, the opinions of man, right? Don't let them become popular. No, he says, I want them to be strong on the inner man. Verse number 16. That he, God the Father, grant you, right, the believer, according to the riches of his, of his glory. In other words, I pray that God do for you what only God can do. I don't want them to bless you the way that another person could be a blessing unto you. No, I want them to bless you out of the storehouses of glory where all of his riches and his goodness is laid up. And he's saying, I want them to bless you with what? To be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. So if we were to break this down into a math equation... What he's saying is, I pray that God the Father, through the person of God the Spirit, take the blessings of God, which are afforded to us by God the Son, and I pray that He just pour out on you the blessings that give you a might or a strength of your inner man that this world can't shake. He's saying, I pray that God would do for you what He did for me. And what's that? That in all of his tribulations, his love for God, the strength of the inner man, was stronger than whatever the world could throw at him. He's saying, people see my tribulations, they feel sorry for me. He says, I feel sorry for them. Because they don't know the strength that comes when God, in your inner man, gives you a purpose and an inner strength to do something for him. He says, I look at all these people and say, oh, well, the Apostle Paul has such a hard life. He say, no, I've got a life where God gave me something to do. That's a life worth living. Regardless of all the heartache, regardless of all the tribulation, all the beatings, all the times that they left him for dead, that he was stoned, that he was thrown into prisons, and he's thinking, I'm having the time of my life. Why? Because the strength of the inner man was stronger than the weakness of the carnal man. Don't get me wrong. We know he had a thorn in the flesh because he played, prayed three times for God to remove it. We know that he had problems, that his body failed him. Some people say it was his eyesight. I don't know what it was. All I know is, is that the Apostle Paul thought it was a problem, thought that it kept him from doing what God would want him to do. But God said his grace was sufficient for him. So he said, all right, I'd rather have it. I'd rather have the thorn and the grace of God and have his strength, which is made perfect in weakness, than to have it be removed and trust in my own strength. He says, I pray that God give you that inner strength that only he can give you. Somebody can come along and with a word fitly spoken, they may be able to lift your spirits through the leading of God, through inspiration of God, through God's wisdom, through something from the Bible. But really all that's doing is just stoking that inner strength that you already had. I can come by and try and be a comfort to you all you know, until I'm blue in the face. It's not going to help you if you don't have something inside of you like Jeremiah said, a fire kindled in your bones. Shut up where no man can touch it, the world can't touch it. That's a fire that God puts in you. Well, where does that come from? It comes from God. Well, how do you get it? Well, verse for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In other words, they say, everybody that's saved down here, everybody that's in the family of God in heaven, you know what they're all called? Sons of God. You know why we're called the sons of God? Because of the Son. Down here on earth, they call us Christians. Why? Because we were born of Christ. He says, we are entitled to the blessings that we have, not because of anything that we've done. We're entitled because God the Father promised them 
But what's the mechanism? Christ. How do you get that fire shut up in your bones? You've got to grow closer to Christ. In fact, Jesus, before he ascended, said that it was profitable for us that he returned to heaven so that the Comforter could come. Well, verse number 16 says that we be strengthened with the might by his Spirit. Because you got into the family, you get a companion, a friend. The greatest help that you will ever have in this world is a Christian. God Himself indwelling the believer, the Holy Spirit. That fire that shut up within us, it's not of us. It is of Christ. But if it's not of man, I can't control it, I can't contain it. So where does that strength come from? The Spirit. But how do we get God and His might to be revealed in us? But that's called a relationship. When he says in verse that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened. You know what it means to grant something to somebody? You give it. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. In fact, anybody that's ever been to college recently, you don't want a student loan, you want a student grant. Because you don't have to pay it back. You couldn't get it on your own, but somebody decided they going to give it to you. Right? Well, what do we know about God? He's no respecter of persons. If he did it for the Apostle Paul, he'll do it for any of us. So the granting isn't the problem. God will give according to his riches, not ours, but according to his. So what keeps people from being strengthened with the might of his spirit? Well, you can only grant something to somebody that's positioned to receive it. You don't get a college grant if you're not enrolled in college. You don't get assistance unless you're trying to do something already. The mechanism to be strengthened is the mechanism that it took you to be saved. Faith. It was your faith in Christ that made you a member of the family. It is your faith to live as God instructs that causes Him to grant you the strength to continue to do what He would have you to do. He gave unto us all the same measure of faith, he gave us the same grace, showed us the same love, He strengthens us with the same strength. God's ways change not. So if we need strength, is it God's fault? No. Really what the Apostle Paul is saying here is I'm praying that God gets you to where you need to be that He can bless you with the strength that you need. He's saying, I know God's got strength. He says, I know God's got glorious riches in heaven that He can bless you with things that will keep your soul charged. It will keep you ready to go day to day even on your worst days. Does that Brother Jordan tell you this is the Apostle Paul man who was persecuted from the day that he got saved. And he says, God's got strength that can get you through it. So if I need strength, what do I need to do? By faith, keep doing what God wants me to do. And then be humble enough to say, Lord, I can't do this. I need your help. Right? Because we are all called by the name of the Son of God why? So that the Son of God gets the glory. If I'm doing it, I'm going to take credit for it. But if He does it, nobody else can take credit for it. If you want to be strengthened, you got to get real small. you got to get weak. you got to get humble. Because His strength, as we've already said, is made perfect in weakness. When the world sees me, or let's take Samson for example. Samson didn't look like Andre the Giant or Lou Ferrigno, right? One of them, or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Samson was the scrawniest, right? Shortest. You looked at that guy and thought, that guy can't even stand up. That's how weak he is. But then God, because it was 
Samson, just by faith, he made a couple of promises in his life. Right? Said he was going to live for God and by faith. When the enemies of God tried to take the people of God and the things of God out of the land of Israel, God would bless Samson with great strength. And you saw some little scrawny guy go out and literally pick up the gates of a city and walk off with them. People weren't thinking, oh wow, Samson's really strong. They were saying, Samson's God's got a whole lot of strength. Because we know Samson couldn't have done it. But God uses those that the world says can't to do. He chooses the base things to confound the wise. Because if it made sense, they could look at us and say, well, he did it. Because that's the way that God made him. I don't know. He uses those that you'd say, there's no way that they did that on their own. Exactly. God did it. He gets all the glory, glory for it. But we're not going to teach on any of that. We get down to verse number 17. He prays that we have that strength of the inner man. Why? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. He says, if you're not strong, you're going to quit. And if you quit, there's not going to be any fellowship. And he says, I pray that God give you strength in your inner man so that you can have a stronger relationship with Christ. The only way you're going to get to know the general any better is on the battlefield. The Lord, He leads the way. The only way that we're going to get closer is to keep following. He says, if you faint because you don't have enough strength, you're not going to have the relationship with Christ. Notice, it didn't say that Christ may occasionally stop by your way. No, no, no. Dwell in your hearts. Permanent and perpetual relationship. Then he goes on to say, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. He says, if Christ moves in, that's what dwell means. Permanent residence. So if Christ is dwelling in your hearts, He's going to put down some roots. He's going to keep you grounded in what? Himself. Because He moved in. And in order for them roots to grow and to keep getting stronger, what has to happen? You've got to have the strength to stay where God wants you to be. Not the strength of man, but the strength of God that even when your flesh wants to run, your faith says, no, this is where God wants us to be and we're not moving until God moves us. If you don't have the strength, right, or if you don't have the gumption to stay where God planted you until God moves you, you're not going to have a relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, you don't get the ladder into verse number 17 of being rooted and grounded. But what are those roots and what's that grounding? What are we rooting ourselves into? Right? What is God causing us to, to grow in us that keeps us on the solid rock? It says keeps you rooted and grounded in love. Look at verse number 18. Well, let's go back to 17 so we get it in context. Right, that you have the strength so that in verse number 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ he says I'm praying that God gives you the strength once you're positioned to receive it so that the Holy Ghost can give you inner man strength so that you can have the relationship with Christ to be rooted and grounded in love why? so that you can understand the breadth in other words you can figure out how wide how tall how deep and how long the love of God is he says first you got to have the strength then you got to have the spirit then through Christ you can be rooted and grounded you can be solid but then here he's saying so that you can know the love of God 
Not just to receive it, but to know it. He says height, depth, breadth, width. In other words, you've got it figured out every which way. Now, we sing about the love of God a lot. Don't get me wrong. Very appreciative for the love of God. But see, by the person of the Apostle Paul, God has written that it, it's, it's His will as a Christian that we know not just about the love of God, not that we just sing about the love of God, but that being rooted through the love of God and grounded into Christ Himself, the chief cornerstone, being grounded on the Son, being grounded through love, that we really start to get or understand what the love of God is. May be able to comprehend with all saints. To comprehend means that you do you can do more than just recite. Right? There's a lot of people that got a lot of the Bible memorized, but they can't tell you what the verses mean. Right? Why do you think our pastor says that he'd rather somebody sit down and read one verse until they get it every day than read five chapters and not be able to tell you anything to happen? Here he's saying, I just don't want you to experience the love of God. I don't want you to just receive the love of God. He says, God intends us to comprehend the love of God. And does it say some people? No, no, no. With all saints. Everybody. Do I have to remind you what the word all means? It means all. All saints mean anybody that's gotten in, God intends them to be strengthened through the Spirit so that they can be solid. Why? So that they can comprehend. Not just comprehend how to live as it. No, no, no. To comprehend the fullness of the love of God. Then look with me. Verse number 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He says that you understand... You comprehend the width, the breadth, height, depth of the love of God. So that, in verse number 19, you can further know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He says that the love of God passes all knowledge. You know what that means? You can't figure it out on your own. This is not something that you can sit down and study until one day a light bulb comes on. The love of God is not something that you can't read about. It is something that you must experience. I know that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I know that God is love. I can read those things, but until I know the one that is love, I don't comprehend the love of God. Until he's more than just my Savior and he becomes the dearest friend I've ever had, my companion, the one that I travel with day in and day out, that through the strength of the Spirit I can have fellowship with him through the Spirit. Until God shows me, not, you know, here, study these things and you'll know the love of God. No, until I experience the full height and breadth and width and depth of the love of God, I will not know the entirety of God's love. But how do you experience the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of God's love? You've got to go through all the situations where God can show you how much He really does love you. You know why the Apostle Paul had a good understanding of the love of God? Because in everything that he went through, he found out that God's love couldn't be exhausted. Keep in mind, he started off, in his own words, chiefest of sinners. He knew how much God had to love him to save him, but then after he got saved, he found out how big God's love really was. But see, until you understand or comprehend the love of God, you don't get the end of verse number 19. 
that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. You want to be full of God? You've got to understand God's love. You want to have the fullness of God in your life? You've got to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Do you think it's any chance that the first fruit of the Spirit of the new creature that He turned us into is love? You can't figure out the love of God, let alone begin to show the love of God on your own. So through the Spirit, when He saved you, He put a seed in you, which was Himself, and He started that plant to start growing and bearing fruit. Well, what's the first one that He lists? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is not the love of man, it is the love of God. Because it is by His Spirit that we receive that love. Do you understand? You don't get to the rest of the fruits of the Spirit unless you try to live in the love of God. Not going to have joy if you don't have an appreciation for the love of God. Not going to have peace if you don't have that inward strength to experience the love of... You know why we have peace in our dark? Because we know that God loves us so much and everything else that He's brought us through, He's not going to bind us now. He's not going to leave us to be destroyed. No, 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 no. Because you start learning about the love of God and you realize He bankrupt heaven for you. He's not going to let you just be cast away for no reason. No, no, no. He loves you with an everlasting love, with an all-powerful love, with an eternal love. That's what gives you peace. That the very God of heaven that spoke everything into existence loves you that much. But if God gives you something to do for Jesus Christ, if you don't comprehend the love of God, are you going to give it your all? If you don't have an understanding of how much God loves you, how much are you really going to love God? Because again, this isn't something that you can read about. These are supernatural. These are eternal, spiritual things. I can take you in the Bible and show you, before Adam sinned in the garden, he didn't have eyes like ours. He could look up and see the third heaven where the throne of God was. He could see angels ascending and descending from heaven. He saw the spiritual and the carnal. But see, we can't see those things. Through the eye of faith, which we've already covered isn't necessary in order to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. But through the eye of faith, we can get just a, a glimpse of how much God loves us. But then where does the true comprehension really come from? Experience. Walking hand in hand, allowing them roots to just keep going deeper and deeper into us. Because you know what those roots are? They're Christ. You know what those roots are digging into? Dirt. Us. We were made from the dust of the ground. Just made out of dirt. But if His roots get real deep into us, we could start bringing out some fruit that doesn't belong to this world. Not because there's anything special about the dirt, but there was something special about that seed that He put in us. Now, the psalmist was inspired right, that He'd be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You know what that meant? Plenty of water and dirt, that tree's going to grow. Even if it didn't rain... There's water right over there. It can Roots can go real deep underneath of that riverbed and get water. Well, if we're rooted and we're deep... Anybody ever read that passage where it says that by the washing of the water of the Spirit, and then it also refers to the Word as water? He's the seed. I mean, do I have to go back and... Verse number, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Christ in us is that eternal mystery revealed in the part of the chapter we didn't read this morning. The mystery that the Apostle Paul was entrusted with. Well, how does that seed get rooted deeper and deeper? we got to yield, get smaller and smaller. The dirt's got to get out of the way to make room for more roots. Dirt's got to get out of the way 
in order for water to become rushing in. Make channels to where I'm not in the way. The Spirit and the Word can refresh my soul. And then what's that do? That builds our faith. Which means I trust more to get more out of the way so that His roots can get deeper. But what I want to teach on this morning, down in verse number 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Then in verse number 8, he talks about how we should know the love of Christ, which is what? The breadth, the length, the depth, and height. So with the Lord's help this morning, just want to teach on how well do you know the love of God? How well do you really know the love of God? Because according to your Bible this morning, not according to Brother Jordan, you should understand the height, the depth, the width, the breadth. You should know more about the love of God today than He did yesterday. Because once you comprehend it, right, somebody didn't teach you about it, they didn't tell you about it until you could repeat what they told you. Right? Until it becomes a part of you, you can't be profitable unto God. You're going to be in that parable of the sower, the seeds that took root but then died off. They either choked out by the thorns the cares of this world, or because of the stones in our heart, the roots couldn't get deep enough to where the seed really took root. Did you get saved? Absolutely. But are you blossoming for Jesus? Are you really blooming and bringing forth much fruit as we were instructed to do? No, what keeps us rooted? Our love of God. Because he only, you know, puts roots down where he's welcome. Keep in mind that Christ dwell in our hearts is what the verse says. That there be a point in your life where you just say, Lord, no more me, all you. That when the world looks at you, because we're written epistles known and read of all men, they don't see you, they just see the roots of Jesus in your life. That's what we should aspire to. But you know what it takes in order to accomplish anything for God? You've got to know about the love of God. You've got to understand it. Back up a second. Doesn't matter what it is that you do for God. Everything that God did for you was out of love. So God expects that everything we do for Him be out of love. But He doesn't want the love of the world. He doesn't want the love that the world's shown all them false idols all throughout history. No, He expects to receive the love that He gave. I can't love God on my own. i got to love Him as God loves. You say, that doesn't make sense. Well, God the Father loved God the Son. Now God the Son, being a part of me, and then God the Spirit being the one that takes the, my prayers before the throne of God. He's the mechanism that things get from me back to God. That's why I can enter directly into the throne room of God. Because I'm not the one doing it. God Himself through the Spirit walks in and says, Jordan's praying again. But all of that, God Himself took on responsibilities to make sure that you just you that could be as the son of God so if he loved us with that love what does he expect he expects the son to put that love into us and for us to show that love back to God because as the son was on the earth what did he do the will of the father because he loved the father so God puts his love in us so that we can love him properly do you ever stop to think that maybe the way that we love God disappoints God? Because we don't know enough about His love? Doesn't say that it's impossible for us. To, no, the Apostle Paul says that we can know everything about the love of God. You may not be able to put it in words to other people, 
You may not be able to write a textbook on it, but you can understand how much God loves you, and you can know how to love God. That's the beginning of your strength. That's the beginning of anything that you do for God. Because God expects you to do it as His Son did it. And who was His Son? Well, He's God, which means He is love. Now, maybe I'm the only one that's ever thought about something like this. But you know all them times in the Gospels where it said that Jesus would go into the synagogue and he'd teach? That he'd open up the Old Testament Word of God and he'd start preaching and teaching to people with the very thing that he penned down. Not with the intellect of man, but with the knowledge of God. Right? Well, when he taught, he taught with the love of God. When he, when he got up and he read that passage of Scripture, he read the very Word of God with the love of God. Which is why they said that didn't our hearts burn within us? When he started preaching, they fell under conviction because they got to understanding how much God loved them. Well, how can we as Christians expect that when God leads us to witness to somebody, Somebody like, if the jails ever do open up, every now and then I'd fill in on a Saturday night for them at the work camp. But if I go over and preach to them fellas, if I get up and teach over here, if God orchestrates it to where you know, everybody's out of town and Jordan's the one holding down the fort, I get up and preach, there's lost people in the pews. How can I ever expect that God be able to use my words to convict those people if I don't do it the same way that Jesus did it? With the love of God. Yes, a track can do a whole lot. But you know how God from the beginning has been saving people? Face-to-face -face conversations. And I understand, I can't talk to everybody. Tracks are great. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with tracks. But I'm saying if God orchestrates it to where you bump into somebody and He wants to give you the words to witness to that person. Behind the scenes, who knows, some planet, some water. But God wants to use you to speak with the very words and the love of God to this person. Could you do it? Do you know enough about the love of God to be able to explain to somebody else how much He loves you, how much He loves them? Do you just repeat phrases that you've heard preachers use throughout the years, or Sunday school teachers, or family members? Or do you really understand what it is for God to love you? Because until you know it, comprehend it, God can't use you. Not the way that He wants to. You think that the Apostle Paul, after he had just gotten beaten, if he wasn't filled with the love of God, that he'd be able to turn around and look at one of the jailers that threw him into jail and say, hey, everybody's here, don't kill yourself. Uh, also, you want to hear about Jesus? And do it in such a manner that the guy fell under great conviction. And I believe not only he got saved, he got saved real good. Because he had such a love of God immediately that what did he do? He started loving the people of God, Paul and Silas. He took them back to his own house. He said, now y'all ain't staying here tonight. You coming home with me. And while he was there, treating their wounds, giving them something good to eat, guess what happens? Well, he starts telling his family about the love of God that he just experienced. Guess what? His whole house got saved. Do you think that happened just because he said, well, you're not going to believe what these guys preached to me about? No, the world wants something real. People have been talking about the love of God ever since the Old Testament, and the world still doesn't believe it. You know why? Because not enough people have known enough about it to live it. Not going to be an effective witness. Not going to be an effective worshiper if you don't know the love of God. You can't even begin to merit the title of Christian, Christ-like, until you first know the love of God. Part of that is having the strength to just stand in those situations that you don't want to be in, but God through it can reveal more about His love towards you. 
You know the people that know the most about the love of God? The people that have been through the most. People aren't signing up and saying, Lord, give me a little tribulation this week so I can know you better. But if that's what it takes, if you love Him, you'll endure it. Because the love that He's put in you gives you a craving for strength from the Spirit to strengthen your inner man so that you can know more about God to live more like the Son of God. I mean, Jesus was love. Not just while He was on earth. He, all, since the alpha of time, God is love. So how do we expect to be able to be Christ-like if we don't fully comprehend the love of God? How do we expect to be pleasing unto the Father unless we love like His Son did? How do we expect to be effective like the disciples, like the apostles, like Christ was without the very love that He used to go and tell the world about Himself? It all starts with love. Then you want to get into strength, peace, hope, long-suffering, gentleness. It's a whole lot easier to be long-suffering and gentle when you have the love of God and you're trying to show it to other people. It is the building block of your Christianity, your spirituality. So the question is, how much do you really know about it? Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.